On March 13 this year, India announced in New York that G20 events would be held across the country, from Kanyakumari to Kashmir. Five weeks later, terrorists attacked an army truck and killed five soldiers in Poonch in Jammu and Kashmir. Two weeks after this, five more army soldiers died in a blast triggered by terrorists in Rajori. The attacks may have been an attempt to try and derail what has actually been planned in Kashmir this week. But India was undeterred and was able to successfully organize a mega three-day international event in Srinagar. This was the biggest international event held in Jammu and Kashmir since Article 370 was diluted and the state was turned into a union territory. A meeting of the G20 Tourism Working Group hosted in Srinagar between May 22nd and the 24th. Issues like ecotourism, destination management, all of these were of course reportedly discussed. A draft strategy to promote India as a destination for film tourism was also released. This was a third meeting with the earlier ones being held in West Bengal and in Gujarat. Goa will be the next host. While the previous meetings happened smoothly, this time the usual suspects went ballistic as the Kashmir event grew nearer. China said it firmly opposes G20 meetings being held in what it called disputed territory and it said it would not attend the event. Beijing had skipped another G20 program in Ladakh. India said it was natural to hold events in Kashmir and in Ladakh, as they are, of course, inalienable parts of the country. Pakistan, which is not even a G20 member and so has absolutely no local standard in the matter, accused India of displaying what it called arrogance and pettiness and said Delhi was violating international law. Now, India's foreign minister said he would not debate this issue with a non-member of G20, a clear reference, of course, to Pakistan. The Indian government pulled out all stops to prevent any disturbance in the valley, Marine commandos or Marcos were seen patrolling the Tal Lake, the Jhelum River and other water bodies. Commandos of the elite NSG conducted area domination exercises and also secured the iconic Lal Chowk. Anti-drone equipment was deployed to keep an eye on the sky. The Indian Army, the BSF, the CRPF, the Sashtra Seema Bal and of course the Jammu and Kashmir Police completed the comprehensive three-tier security grid all of which made sure that nothing untoward actually happened. Finally, on May the 22nd, the G20 event kicked off. Jammu and Kashmir's cultural wealth was on full display as the delegates roamed around the historic city. 61 delegates from 29 countries did show up. They participated in the meeting. Srinagar saw a higher participation compared to the earlier meetings of the tourism working group. The event did gather a lot of positives for Jammu and Kashmir and for India in general. One of the biggest takeaways from the event was that it showed that normalcy was coming back to the valley. The very fact that an event like this was able to be held and 29 countries came was a major factor. This was also demonstrated by the rather crucial point that residents ignored calls for a shutdown by separatist elements. Another key highlight is that because of the heavy security deployments, foreign delegations saw firsthand the threat that was being posed by terrorists sponsored by Pakistan. The G20 program also displayed tourism opportunities in Kashmir to the international community. Of course, it is the most beautiful part of the country in many ways. It's debatable, I know, but many people would say it's the most beautiful part of the country. So in a sense, it was great that the international delegates got a chance to actually experience that for themselves. On the economic front, the event acted as an invitation to investors by demonstrating the efficiency of the security apparatus to maintain peace. Amid all of this, China and Pakistan did try one last ploy. While Beijing completely skipped the event, some other countries chose to send private or low-level delegations. These included Turkey and Saudi Arabia, Islamic countries which have been vocal on Kashmir, either individually or through the OIC. Egypt and Oman, who are not G20 members but were specially invited by India, also stayed away from the Srinagar meetings. But this, of course, was overshadowed by the response of the other countries, including the G7 group of rich nations. America left no room for speculation, but its delegation chief saying he was happy to participate in the meeting in Srinagar. By successfully pulling off this major event, has India emphatically won the perception battle on Kashmir? 
Is it an important step, though, that should now be built on to take other steps specifically when it comes to Jammu and Kashmir? And let's now talk to somebody who's a real expert on Jammu and Kashmir and who's been talking a lot about the steps that need to be taken forward, looking ahead in Jammu and Kashmir, India's ex spy master and a real authority on Jammu and Kashmir, Mr. A.S. Dulat. Well, Mr. Dulat, always a pleasure to talk to you and to get your sense of what is happening. It's increasingly rare that you actually agree to come and talk, so it's so, so good to talk to you. You must be, um, uh, be, have kept a very close eye on what's happened with G20, and it's a major positive that India was able to successfully pull off this entire G20 event in Srinagar uh, with all the world's diplomats out there. How do you interpret what's happened in Srinagar this week? Well, I think it's a, it's a very good, positive thing that it's happening. My, you know, this is a question that I uh, tried to answer uh, Karan with my last interview. He asked me the same thing. I said, you know, I think it's a great uh, move because... Uh, it shows that uh, there is normality there, whatever, whatever we are trying to project. But I thought that, uh, you know, this was perhaps not the best time because this is the peak uh, tourist season. And however we look at it, uh, for these three, four, five days, it's going to disrupt uh, tourism, you know, because uh, uh, Srinagar has been turned into a sort of a fortress with a lot of security all around. Well, it's not the ideal uh, uh, sort of situation for tourists. But uh, I'm sure tourists will come back and things will be all right. The other thing is the, the negative part of uh, whatever is happening in Srinagar is that the Muslim countries have opted out. You know, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, uh, Egypt, and of course China. So, uh, you know, uh, the, the Kashmiris look at it like this, that uh, the Muslims then uh, are in support of us. We have problems. And the Muslim countries haven't come. The, the only Muslim representation there is uh, from Indonesia, I think. And uh, the diplomats that you talk about, uh, I'm told, other than uh, Singapore, whose ambassador is there, there are uh, low-level people from the embassies. You know. So all these things get noted. Kashmiri is, is uh, he doesn't miss anything, you know. And the, the general sense in Kashmir, uh, although they are reconciled to 370 and all that, they know it's gone. But uh, it's not a very happy state of affairs in Kashmir, you know. But uh, there is nothing, nothing happening. There is nothing positive from the Kashmiri point of view. And I've always said um, time and time again that uh, the way forward, if you want to move forward, is that you, you revive the old uh, political and democratic process. Okay, I'm going to discuss all of those in, in, in some detail. But obviously, first, the G20 aspect. Um, do you think India was successful in sending a certain message on the global stage on Jammu and Kashmir, the fact that a G20 event could be held and held safely and successfully in Srinagar. Did that help in projecting a certain image? Yes, a couple of countries didn't come, but overall, was there a certain image that was successfully projected to the rest of the world? Yeah, I think it does in a sense that, you know, you've got so many diplomats there and you've got them in Srinagar and they'll go back home to Delhi or wherever safely. Uh, I think it's a good positive thing because, you know, one of the problems in Kashmir is that even bureaucrats from Delhi don't visit Kashmir. Hmm. And the, the setup that we have in Kashmir, because it's, a, it's a, there's a lieutenant governor in charge, most of the bureaucrats in Kashmir today are outsiders. So that again is, is resented locally. <laughs> Who do we talk to? There's no Kashmiri here. So, the feeling, general feeling in Kashmir is that the worst government is better than what, what we have. Because at least it will be our people and we'll be able to approach somebody. So basically you're saying build on this and at some point the political process should restart now. Absolutely. I don't see it happening, but I, I do see it should restart. Incidentally today, you know, Chomsky has made a very powerful statement 
criticizing this whole business of uh, holding G20 in Srinagar. And that has been put out by the Hurriyat Conference. The Hurriyat itself has not said anything, but they have put out Chomsky on, on the post. You know. So on that question, Mr. Dulat, obviously, look, the, look, uh, the, the hold of the Hurriyat clearly does seem to be going down. And even when it comes to Pakistan, given the chaos and the mayhem that is taking place inside Pakistan, you could argue that the ability of Pakistan to be seen as effective in anything, including in Jammu and Kashmir, has gone down dramatically. Would you agree with that view? And does that, therefore, throw up certain opportunities as well? I do. I do agree with it. Pakistan is in a, in a hell of a mess. But for the Kashmiri, you know, he still holds out. It's not that the, the Kashmiri wants to go to Pakistan or join Pakistan. That's long over. And uh, let me also make it clear that the Huriyat is dead. There is no Huriyat now. Separatism is over. There's just one gentleman who is uh, you know, under house arrest who is still of substance. And I think uh, we are wasting him, and that's the male life. Because he's, he's sufficiently mainstream, and I, I don't think there is much difference between him and the National Conference or Mehruga or whatever it is that they're thinking. But uh, uh, since he doesn't have a say, and he's been kept in his house, he can't come to the mosque. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a nothing thing there. I don't think separatism is an issue, and I don't think in the sense that you mentioned Pakistan is not not an issue. But what I want to try to say is that uh, Pakistan provides that little sort of support or hope that if India and Pakistan have a better relationship, then things in Kashmir will improve. That's the way the Kashmiri looks at it. Right, Mr. Dulat, but if I can just put it to you, I don't see New Delhi having too much interest in talking to Pakistan right now, especially given the mess that Pakistan is. Uh, who's going to, whom are you going to talk to in Pakistan? Uh, who is actually in charge out there? And even if you do talk to somebody in Pakistan, are they in any position to deliver on anything that they might say to you? There could be an argument made that, look, Kashmir is an internal matter. That's the way it should be viewed. This could be an opportunity to do something internally more attractive than talking to Pakistan. Take advantages of the opportunity that there could be in the valley right now, especially after G20. As you were saying, separatism could be dead. Pakistan is in a mess and may have been wiped out. Not that much violence or militancy taking place right now. Restart some political dialogue perhaps internally. Talk to your own people, do something internally and ignore Pakistan. Would that be a particular point of view on how to take things forward now? Absolutely. But I'd like to correct you here on one little point that you made, that uh, militancy or terrorism is down. You know, recently in the Jammu area, things have been pretty bad. There have been a couple, two, three very bad attacks on the army there. And if you if you know that area, the Punch Rajori area, the army is in full control. It may be the Rastri Rifles or whatever it is, and it, it's, it's a deadly attack there. And it's a vulnerable area. It's, it's, it's not easy. And uh, that Bimba Dali and uh, Suran Court and all that thing, it's, it's, and it's, uh, it's not the end of it, to my way of thinking. And I am also, I'm also apprehensive that, uh, you know, most of the militancy, and I hear I, I make a, a differentiate between militancy and terrorism. I would like to think that militancy is our homegrown thing, boys in South Kashmir mostly. But what happens in the North, is that's the, the deadliest attacks take place there. Because that's where the foreign terrorists are. And whether they are in Baramula or Sopor or Kupwara, we don't know. You know that uh, in the last couple of years, we've had attacks in Srinagar, which never happened after the early 90s. You know. They have targeted whoever they like, and quite a few Kashmiri pundits have been uh, killed. That uh, lady who was a teacher in a sick uh, lady in a, in a school, she was uh, shot, and uh, outside neighbors have been killed. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not over. And I would think that uh, even, even whatever mess Pakistan uh, may be in, which it is, the ISI is still functioning. 
All right, uh, Mr. Dullah, thank you so much. Always a pleasure talking to you. Build on G20, build on the G20 summit in Srinagar by taking steps forward in Jammu and Kashmir is your advice. Thank you so much for joining us.